أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته المنتجبين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا مظلوم يا غريب يا شهيد كربلاء يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين يقولون ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة عين قرة أعين واجعلنا للمتقين إماما صلوا على محمد وآل محمد A second for the love of Imams Al-Hassan and Hussein A third for the love of Fatima al Zahra with your loudest voices. When you have reached the age where you feel that it's time to get married, you've finished what you've had to do, you've graduated, you started working you've raised enough money, and you've decided that it's time to get married. You meet, you meet people, you meet some, maybe a handful, more, less. Finally, you meet someone who you're most comfortable with. It seems like the right person, the qualities that you've been looking for. And indeed, the qualities that you want are found in this person whether it's the man or the woman, and you get married and everything is fine, alhamdulillah. Everything is perfect. At other times, there are others that are not so fortunate. They meet several people. They have several qualities in mind that they're looking for, whether it has to do with looks, with intelligence, with personality, with faith and religion. Finally, they meet someone who they believe 
has either all of the qualities that they're looking for or most of the qualities that they're looking for. However, after a while, either after they get married or before they get married, of course, after they get married, that's a, that's a disaster. They discovered that this is not what they had signed up for. This person turned out to be different from what they had perceived. The qualities that this person has now are fading away. Now this person's true colors are coming up and showing. And then obviously what happens? The marriage fails. If they're engaged, the engagement breaks off. And if they're married, the marriage fails if they decide to divorce. Or if they decide to stay together, then it's a reckless marriage. It's a marriage that has no bond, no love, and no harmony. Of course, either way, this is disastrous. If they remain together with no love, that's one disaster. If they decide to end it, that's also a disaster. Because a relationship like this can leave a lot of marks, can leave a lot of scars, can leave a person emotionally drained. And now that this person wants to remarry, wants to meet someone else, will have a lot of insecurities. Will ask a hundred questions now in their mind about the new person that they meet. What if this new person turns out to be like the old person? What if this person is a fake? What if this person seems to have good qualities, but then when I marry them, they switch. They turn out to be something that they're not, right? So this person develops a lot of insecurities. Now this person is afraid of getting into another relationship. This person is afraid of getting to know people because they're afraid this person might switch on them. They begin doubting everyone. You know, a lot of people before marriage and after marriage, they're two different people. You see a person before marriage, this person's romantic. He calls 15 times a day. He's sweet, he's nice, he's polite, he brings roses, you know, he takes you out. He's very different. All of a sudden you're married, two months, three months after the marriage, and he's completely a different person. Now he's angry. Now he breaks things. At the slightest comment, he'll snap, he'll start yelling. He's not as religious as he seemed before the marriage. Or it could be the other way around, the lady. Before the marriage, she was perfectly fine. She had a good personality. Uh, she was sweet. Now, after the marriage, seems like she has a sharp tongue. She has to comment about everything, a negative comment. Nothing satisfies her, so on and so forth. Why is it that a lot of times, People find, you know, their, their spouse or the person that they've met to change all of a sudden on them. What happened? Why do people change all of a sudden? Do people change? You see, it's not that people change. Yes, to you, this person's attitude changes. This person was very nice before the marriage. Now after the marriage, he's not so nice. It's not that he changed or she changed. Most of the times, this is how the person was before the marriage. But that's the side that you did not get to see. That's the side of her that you didn't see. That side was hidden. That side of his was hidden. Why? Because he doesn't want to show you all of his sides right before marriage. He's trying to gain customers. He's trying to win your heart. So if he has a bad temper after a marriage, most likely he had that bad temper when? Before marriage as well. But he wasn't showing it to you.
If she has a sharp tongue after marriage, most likely she had a sharp tongue before marriage as well. But you didn't know because she wasn't showing it. Obviously because she's engaged. She's trying to get married. She doesn't want to break off of that marriage. She doesn't want to ruin her relationship. That's a lot of times, this goes for many people. Before marriage, the days, the weeks, the months before marriage, they're engaged, they're meeting people, they hide their bad qualities. <coughs> they hide their bad qualities and they emphasize their good qualities. And that's something normal. You know, when you go to people's homes as, as guests, they're sweet, they're nice. You know, the husband and wife, they're, they're smiling, they're laughing, they crack jokes. The, the kids respect the, the parents, the parents respect the kids. But then when everyone goes back home, they start punching each other. Because that was a show. Obviously, there's guests, they have to put on some sort of show. The husband and wife probably, maybe they don't talk. But in front of guests, they have to talk. Thus, this is part of human nature. We choose which side of ours that we want to show to people. And a lot of times in marriage, this is the case. It's not just your, uh, your spouse or the person that you're marrying. We too, you too, you're not showing all of your sides. You're not showing your grouchy side, your angry side, your sharp tongue. Your, you're showing the side that is the most attractive because you're trying to win someone's heart. So when you see a person all of a sudden change after two months or three months or a year from the marriage, they didn't really change. It's the qualities that they had before the marriage but you hadn't seen, that you didn't really get to know about. And this is not hypocrisy. This is not hypocrisy. Otherwise, all human beings are hypocrites. No, this is natural in instinct. We were raised this way. We're biologically engineered it's like some animals that camouflage, right? Why do animals camouflage? To protect themselves, so that they don't get attacked. Humans also camouflage. They don't camouflage in their bodily colors, they camouflage in their attitudes. So, to win people's hearts. Now, and I hope I, you know, I, don't, I didn't make seem things really bad for those that are trying to get married. Now that you've met someone, someone you've, you've met recently, they seem like a good person, he or she, they have the qualities, most of the qualities that you're looking for, but how do you know? How do you know that this is the right person for you? How do you know that this person is not going to switch? This, this person, a year from the marriage, is not going to seem like the Antichrist. How do you know for sure that you're going to be compatible and that you're going to have a happy wedding, happy marriage, and everything is going to work out perfectly after the wedding? How do you know that this is the right person for you? Well, to be sure that this is the right person, some people go to you know, extreme measures. Some depend on horoscopes. Okay, well, I'm a... Uh, Gemini and he's a Scorpio and I don't know do they get along supposedly let's say they get along okay well the horoscope says we get along inshallah we'll get along others go and do a background check they go and do a police report about this person their background their history where they've been what they've done have they been to jail that's also extreme others depend on istikhara they go to the Sayyid or the Shaykh and they say, I'd like to perform an istikhara. I want to see, is this person compatible with me or not? Tonight, my dear brothers and sisters, in the limited time that we have tonight, we'd like to see how can we know for sure that is this person that we've met, that we'd like to marry, is this person the right person for us? Should we depend on an istikhara, as some people do? Should we take an istikhara? Should we 
you know, just take our chances and marry this person and hope for the best? Should I go and visit a fortune teller to see is this person going to stick with me or not? What is it that we should do to know that this person is the right person for us? Tonight, I'd like to introduce a 10-step procedure to know. Muhammad <laughs> Number one, the first step, do not rush. Do not rush. I know most of you that are not married, obviously you're in a rush. You're 30 years old, more, less. You've waited a long time. You've earned your degree. You've worked. You've made some money. You, uh, you have enough to build a family. You've waited long enough. Enough is enough. Now you want to start a family, you want children, you know, there's some gray hair popping up in your beard, and the train is not going to wait for you. However, as long as you've waited, doesn't mean you should rush. You've met a person. Doesn't mean that you should marry that person within a week. You barely know that person. Let's get married. No. If you've waited 30 years, you could wait another two months. You could wait another three months to get to know this person. Why the rush? A lot of couples, they make the mistake as soon as they meet the person. After a week, after two weeks, after a month, they're engaged and they're already planning the, the wedding. Why? What's the rush? And unfortunately, this is part of human nature. People are always in a rush. وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ عَجُولًا خُلِقَ, خلق الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلٍ Man is hasty, the Quran says. Man was made from ajal, from being hasty. Wanting to rush. And the hadith tell us that being hasty is not good. Rushing the things is not good. Whatever it is. الْعَجَلَةُ مِنَ الْشَيْطَانِ Being hasty, that's part of the instructions from shaitan, he tells you to rush, rush into things, whatever it is. Now this is a long life commitment. The person you will marry, this is a long life commitment for richer, as Christians say, for richer, for poorer, till death, do us part. You're signing up forever, until death do you part. So why do you want to rush? Good to know this person. Don't rush. There are some couples that rush within a week. Within a week, they, they feel that they've made their decision. They made up their mind. Or within two weeks. Or even within a month. That's not a lot of time. Get to know that person. What, what will you know about a person within a week? What will you know about a person within 10 days? Or even within a month? Not a lot. So take your time. You know, there's people that when they buy a house, they take six months. Which is more important, buying a house or getting married? Finding a husband or finding a wife? A house is always replaceable. Don't tell me that a wife is also replaceable. I know she's replaceable. But when you have kids, are your emotions are also replaceable? Are your kids also replaceable? Some things are not replaceable. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The second step. First, you don't rush. Second, ask about this person. Obviously, when you meet a, a new person, you don't know everything about this person. You don't know about their past, their history, their akhlaq their manners, their faith, their religion, their habits. You don't know everything. Thus, you have to ask. You have to ask that person's friends. I'm not saying go and do a, a background check. I'm not saying go to the nearest police station and do a background check on that person. No, you don't need to do that. You don't need to get paranoid. But ask that person's friends, current friends, and former friends. The local Islamic center or Husseiniyah that that person goes to. Your prospective spouse. 
Go to that center. Go to that Husseiniya. Ask people, what have you seen from this person? Is this person a regular? Does he always come to the Husseiniya? Does he attend the events? Ask the, the local Sayyid or Shaykh or the Imam of the Islamic Center. What do you think of this person? Do you see him on and off? What do you think of his akhlaq? If this person was married before, ask. Ask his uh, ex-wife. <coughs> ask, ex ask her uh, ex-husband. Why did he get divorced? What happened? What was the reason? Do your research. There's some people that do research when finding a job, finding a house, buying even a car. They do a lot of research. They spend months doing their research. They look online, they ask. But when it comes to marriage, for some reason they forget to do their research. They forget to ask. Ask about this person's reputation. Ask what people think about this person. This is very important. People's perception about the person that you like to marry, that person's reputation. And let them know, let them know, this young man has come and proposed to you, he's proposed to your family, let him know that you're going to ask about him, so that he doesn't get offended. Because perhaps people will tell him that, you know what, so and so family, they're asking about you, they're asking about your you know, your religiosity, they're asking about your akhlaq. So let him know so that he doesn't get offended. Or let her know that you've asked about her from family members, from community members, so they don't, they don't get offended. And if, by the way, if you're ever asked, what do you think of so-and-so person for marriage? You have to be honest. That is not permissible to lie in such cases. Those who lie in such cases, that's the worst kind of lying. You have to be honest. If you're asked, what do you think of this person? And you know certain things about that person, about their past, about their habits, about their akhlaq, about you have to be honest. You can't lie. That person is asking for your genuine opinion. They're asking you for advice. You can't hold that advice. You have to be honest. And by the way, it will not be considered ghibah. It will not be considered backbiting. Even if you had to say some things that are bad about that person. These are one of the exceptions of ghibah. The, one of the exceptions of backbiting is asking for advice when you ask for advice regarding marriage. You are allowed to say everything that you know about this person. You are not allowed to conceal your knowledge. Say, say your opinion, say what you think of this person, and it will not be considered riba. You have to be honest. Give your opinion. This is the second step. Ask about that person. Ask from the local Islamic center, ask from the local imam, from the shaykh, from the sayyid, from the community members. Number three, salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Number three, get to know this person. Get to know this person. Once you've heard good things about this person, about this lady, about this young man, this person has a good reputation, now get to know him. Get to know her. You might say, well, why did you first say ask about him or her and then get to know? Shouldn't we get to know him first or get to know her first and then ask? Why did we switch? No. If you ask me, of course, this is not halal or haram. This is not set in stone. It's up to you at the end of the day. But if you ask me personally, I say first ask about the person. Ask about her or ask about him. Get people's perception about that person. Know what that person's reputation is like. What if you ask about her? And she ends up having, having a very bad reputation. Do you still want to get to know her? If she has the worst reputation, for example. People are telling you, no, stay away from her. Or stay away from him. Do you still want to get to know that person? And waste your time? And waste his time or her time? Why? First get to know that person. 
Because reputation is everything, my dear friends. Reputation tells you a lot about that person. How people perceive that person, how people perceive her, him in the community. What do they know of this person? Do they see him at the Islamic Center? Does he participate? Is he religious? Does he pray? Does she wear hijab? How's her reputation? That tells you a lot. When you ask about a person's reputation, you've done half of your homework. The other half is getting to know that person. So if you ask about a, about a person, and that person has a good reputation, go ahead, get to know him. Or, you know, if you get mixed, mixed uh, opinions, some say, yes, this person is good. I've, they vouch for that person. Others, they're a bit, you know, iffy. You could still get to know that person. But if a person has an absolutely bad reputation, people are telling you, stay away. This person doesn't have a good name. This person doesn't have a good reputation. Why do you, why do you want to waste your time? Why do you want to waste your time and bring a person into your house and get to know them when everyone knows that this person has a bad reputation? Why? So that's why I say ask first and then get to know. And then get to know. Or do both. But at least let that person have a good reputation or you know, generally not a bad reputation. Now, is it permissible to get to know this person? You've proposed to someone. Can you get to know this lady? Someone has proposed to you. Is it okay for you to get to know this person? Sit together, have a conversation, talk, have a discussion. Is this permissible? Absolutely. Of course. Of course you could sit with this person. Of course you can have a discussion. Well, as long as it's within, within the red lines, you haven't crossed any lines within, within the borders, of course, get to know this person. Get to know this person's akhlaq, this person's personality. Get to know them. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, you don't even need supervision. You don't need parental supervision. That young man and young woman could sit together and talk, yes, as long as it's not in a closed area. If it's in a public area, they don't need any parental supervision. As long as there's no khalwa, it's not a closed area in a closed room, that's fine. They could sit, they could talk. As long as it's in a, you know, in a legitimate means, they're getting to know each other with the intention of marriage, that's fine. In, in fact, that is encouraged. Know the person that you're getting married to. Don't have surprises. Don't meet someone and then be shocked or surprised later on. Now there are some, I know this is controversial. There are some young men and women that choose to, in order to get to know each other, of course, with the consent of the family, to have a temporary marriage to get to know each other for a month or two months with the family's consent and approval and blessings to help facilitate, they do that. That is up to you. That is up to the family. That is up to the father, the mother, and the family whether they choose to do that or not. What I'm trying to say is they should get to know each other. And if you ask me, if you ask for my personal opinion and from experience that I've seen with people, you need at least two months a good two months with this person in order to know about this person, to know about their habits, their personality. Within two months, within two months, you know, two months is reasonable. It's not too little and it's not too much. It's perfect. Within two months, you will get to see the good side of this person and at the same time, you'll get to see the bad side of this person. Within two months, you'll be, you'll be able to discover is this person angry, or does this person not have, a, not have temper issues? Is this person generous or is this person stingy? Is this person uh, you know, you know, religious or not religious? You'll be able to discover these things within the first two months. I think that is a reasonable amount of time. So ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. The fourth step.
do not be emotional. This is a time when you're getting to know a person, when you're trying to discover, is this person the right person for you? This is a time where you put your emotions aside. This is, a, this is not a time for emotions. When making an assessment, try to be as logical as possible and as less emotional as possible. Don't judge things based on looks. A lot of people, the first judgment that they make is based on looks. Is this person attractive or not? Is this person the way you want them to be or not? If they're not, they, don't, they won't give this person a chance whatsoever. That's being emotional. Basing things purely on looks. Or this person has a, a good sense of humor, so he must be a good person. Or you clicked. You clicked. Within the first session or two sessions, that's being emotional. How do you know that after the 10th session, after the first couple of months, you're compatible? That's being irrational. That's being emotional. At the same time, there's some people that are too picky as well. There's people that are too picky as well. You know, this person, he's not tall enough for me. I'm tall and I want someone to be tall and he's not tall enough. Or his nose, I don't like that nose. Or uh, his accent, no, that accent doesn't work. Is this, being, is this being logical? Are you giving this person a chance? You're basing a marriage based on that person's nose? Well, I have to say it depends on which kind of nose it is. It varies from nose to nose. But if it's a good nose, that will do. You don't ruin a marriage. You don't base a marriage based on these small things based on these small things. Look deeper in that person. Look deeper in that person. Don't be artificial. <coughs> Try to look deeper in that person. Look deeper in that person's qualities, that person's traits. Perhaps you will find something that you're looking for. Yes, attraction is necessary. I'm not saying do not marry someone that you're not attracted to. No, no, no. You have to marry someone that you're attracted to. Is attraction the most important quality? No. But it, is it a necessary quality? Yes. Yes, there has to be attraction in the marriage. If you marry someone that you're not attracted to, that marriage will not last. In fact, a hadith of Ahlul Bayt tell us this. Marry someone that's attractive. Marry someone that has long hair. Marry someone, there's qualities that have been mentioned in the hadith. Definitely let there be attraction. But is that the most important thing that you should look for? Is, should that be number one? No. There are certain things that are, that are more important. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The fifth step. Now that you're getting to know this person, ask the right questions. You see, a lot of people, they have two months or three months, maybe you have a year, and you thought that they got, you got to know that th this person in that year, but you didn't. Because you didn't ask the right questions. You didn't make the right investigations. And, you know, I see a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of young people, a lot of couples, when they get together, they ask each other questions, they ask the most silly questions. What is your favorite movie? For real? You're going to base your marriage on what's your favorite movie? Well, obviously he's going to say Titanic. You expect him to say something else? He's going to choose the movie that you like. And when you happen to both like the same movie, you think you're compatible because you like the same movie. Or what's your favorite food? Obviously, he's going to tell you, you know, anything that comes out of your kitchen will be my favorite food. He's going to tell you what you'd like to hear. What's your favorite? Don't ask, what's your favorite this? What's your favorite that? Ask real questions. Ask questions that will tell you something about their personality. About that person's religiosity. Ask him or her, do they pray on time? When is it that you pray? Write 
at the top of the adhan, or an hour after, or five hours after? Ask. Ask them a tricky question. What time is Salat al-Fajr? And make it a bit, you know, a bit tricky. Give them multiple choice. Is it 5.48 or 5.58? You know, make it difficult. If a person that you're marrying does not know the time of Fajr, that's up to you. Do you want to marry that person? That tells you a lot. That tells you a lot. Knowing the times of prayers. Among the questions, how often do you go to Majalis? Ask this question. Do you go just 10 times out of the year, 10 nights out of the year during Muharram and then you disappear all year long? Or are you a regular? You attend Majalis. You attend your local Islamic center. You attend your Hassani. These are the questions that you should ask for. Among the questions, what is your view on hijab and makeup? Ask. Ask your prospective spouse. Ask your future wife. Ask her, what do you think of hijab? Don't ask her, do you wear hijab? Obviously, you'll be able to tell. Ask her, what is your view on hijab? What is your view on makeup? You want to see, are your views compatible or not? You see, my dear friends, something that's very important is that there's intellectual compatibility as well. You want to be on the same level. You don't want to be up here and the person that you're marrying is, is over here on the intellectuality. You know, there's, there's no intellectual compatibility. You want to be on the same level. I'm not saying you have to share all of your views. It's okay to disagree. But is there some intellectual compatibility? There has to be. So ask, for example, do you listen to music? Hopefully you'll get an honest answer and that they don't listen to music. Do you go to mixed gatherings, mixed parties, mixed weddings? This is a very important question. Do you go to these mixed events where people are wearing flashy clothing and there's no hijab and there's lots of makeup and there's lots of interaction and there's lots of you know, chatting and jokes? If you care about these things, at least you should ask. You should ask your future spouse. Among the questions you should ask your future husband or wife, do you have friends from the opposite gender? And do you keep in touch with them? And do you mix with them? This is a very important question. If you're the type that doesn't want your wife to have male friends, all of a sudden you discover that most of her friends are male. Well, at least you know, you know this ahead of time. Not that after the marriage you discover that she doesn't have any girlfriends. You know, all of her friends are male. Or the opposite. You marry a guy and he didn't know this, all of a sudden you discover that he has a lot of female friends and you're not comfortable with that. At least discover this before the marriage. Before the wedding. And one of the most important questions that you should ask your future spouse is, what do you think of Sayyid Hussain al-Qazwini's lectures? <laughs> this is a very important question. Make them list at least five of his lectures. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The sixth step, and this is, you know, this is quite contemporary. We wouldn't be talking about this 10 years ago. By now we have to. The sixth step is go and see that person's social networking sites, accounts, that person's Facebook, that person's Twitter, that person's Instagram, that person's, I don't know, there's, there's, new, there's new sites every day. I can't keep up with them. And mashallah, the youth, every day, every, whenever there's a new site, they have an account. Whatever site, there's, they have to have that account. Go and see. What are they posting? What kind of pictures is she posting? You know, you can tell a lot about a young lady or a young man just by their Facebook accounts or their Twitter accounts or their Instagram accounts. Go see the pictures. Are they good pictures? Or are they flashy pictures? Lots of makeup. The hijab is, you know. Go see. Go see what is on their account. Go look at their statuses. 
Their tweets. Do they use foul language? You know, I see a lot of youth on these social networking sites, they use foul language. That tells a lot about their character. What kind of language are they using? What do they tweet about? Anything Islamic? What are their interests? You can discover so much just by looking at a person's Facebook, or a person's Twitter, or a person's Instagram. Go, see. You might be surprised. You might discover things that you did not know about, about this person. Again, these are certain things, you know, when I got married, this didn't exist. I'm sure many of the elders here, uh, this, this didn't exist at their time. But today, these things exist. And these things say a lot about a person's character, a lot about a person's personality, a lot about a person's religiosity. Go and see. Take a look at that person's accounts and perhaps you'll discover a lot of things the si the seventh step ala muhammad wa ala muhammad the test give that person a test i'm not talking about the hiv test or anything no no astajirullah nothing like that give a person a personality test or a religious test how? How do, you, how do you give a person a test? You give them a question, a hypothetical question. For example, the lady, for example, she tests her prospective husband. She tells him, what would you do after we got married if I took off my hijab? What would you do? What would be your reaction? Are you okay with that? Or would you divorce me? Would you go marry, marry another wife? Or what would you do? What is your reaction? That's a very important question. That will tell you a lot about that person. Or the, the man can ask the lady, what would you do, hypothetically speaking, what would you do after the marriage if I asked you to take off your hijab? Now hopefully this lady is wearing a hijab when you married her. She, she, if she's not wearing a hijab, no, that's another problem. But we're assuming that she wears hijab. You tell her, what would you do if I ask you to take off your hijab? Look at her reaction. Look at her answer. Her answer will say a lot about her, about her religiousness, about her religion. It will say a lot about her akhlaq, about her personality. Does she have a strong personality? Does she have a strong character or not? Ask hypothetical questions. Ask, what if I stopped praying? What would you do? What if I started drinking? What would you do? Hypothetical scenarios, hypothetical questions. This will tell you a lot about that person. What if I lost my job? Ask her, what if I lost my job and I went bankrupt? Would you still marry me? You'll be able to discover, did she marry you for your money? Or no? What if I lost my citizenship to Canada? We'll be able to discover, did she marry you for your Canadian passport? Or she married you for you? You tell him, what if I got in a car accident and my face got disfigured? And I'm not as beautiful. Would you still live with me? You know, that could happen. Have you seen the movie Vanilla Sky? Yes, no, I don't know. Some people could get in a car accident and their face is disfigured and they lose their beauty. Well, if you married her for your beauty, guess what? It's over now. The reason why you married her now, it's gone. Are you going to stick with her or not? Ask him that question. What would you do? These are hypothetical questions that will tell you a lot about that person. About that person's personality, about that person's attitude, about the way that person thinks. Give a question, they give a, a test. This is a test. Imam Ali alayhi salam. He gave his wife, Umm al Banin, a test the night of his wedding. He gave her a test. He discovered that she's extremely beautiful, the outer appearance, but he wanted to see which beauty? The inner beauty as well. He wanted to see if the outer. Beauty, does it match the inner beauty or not? He asked her a question. 
He told her, do you have any request for me on a night like this, the night of her wedding? She thought about it for a moment. She said, yes, I want you to change my name. Her name was Fatima. Why? She said, because your children, your orphan children, when they hear the name of Fatima, they will, they will remember their mother, Fatima Zahra. And their hearts will be broken. I don't want their hearts to be broken, so change my name. This was a test. She passed the test. And that day he called her Umm al -Banin. This was a test. Imam, Imam Ali salam gave his wife a test. Why don't you give your future spouse a test so that you will get to know them. You'll discover them. The eighth step, get your parents' opinion. Let your father know what he knows. Let your, ask your father what he thinks. Ask your mother what she thinks. You know, your, our parents, they care for us. They care for us more than we care for ourselves. They want what's best for us. What's best for us? They'll always keep an eye out for you f throughout your life. Ever since you're a child, they kept their eye out for you. Now that you're getting married, obviously they're, they'll be overprotective. They want the best wife or husband for you. Ask their opinion. Their opinion matters. This is one. They want the best for you. Two, your parents will give you rational advice. Logical advice, not emotional advice. Because when you get to know a person, emotions will be involved. And sometimes emotions will not let you think clearly. You will start thinking emotional. But your parents, they're not thinking emotionally. They're thinking logically and rationally. They will see aspects of that person which you're not seeing. Things that you're not seeing in this person, your parents are seeing. Your mother will catch things that you, did not, that you did not catch. Your father will catch things that you did not catch. Get their opinion. Ask them, what do you think? This is why in Islam that the father, the father has wilaya over his daughter. He has authority. He has the final say. He has the final veto. He could decide whether this person is good for my daughter or not. Because the father thinks logically and rationally. He's not thinking emotionally. You know, if his, if his daughter is thinking emotionally, she's in love with this guy because he told her, you know, he sweet-talked her. He told her that he loves her. You know, this is not going to... This is not going to work. That magical spell that the young man has on the girl is not going to work on her father. He's not going to think emotionally. He's going to think rationally. That's why the father has the final say. Ask for their opinion. Their opinion matters. Your parents want the best for you. Ask your siblings as well. Even though your siblings have no authority, ask for their opinion. Their opinion also matters. You're looking for a young lady to marry as a wife? Ask what your th sister thinks. You know, your sister is going to do her own investigation. She's going to look at angles and aspects that you're not paying attention to. Ask. A person comes and proposes to you. A young man comes and proposes to you. Ask what your brother thinks of him. Ask for his opinion. His opinion matters. Because he will look at angles that you did not look at. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The ninth step, get away from everyone, put your phone aside, put your computer aside, and think, think, think. Think rationally, think logically. Don't let anyone persuade you. Don't have anyone influence you. This is your chance to think about it. And take your time. There's no rush. You don't want to make a mistake. Marry someone, and then you discover you married the wrong person. Think clearly, think rationally, think logically, take as much time as you want, and make your decision. The tenth step, istikhara. Is this necessary? Is it necessary for a person to make an istikhara? If you're confident about a person, you're, you've done your research, you've asked, You've asked about that person's reputation. You got to know that person.
You feel, you feel confident about that person. There's no need for an istikhara. <coughs> if you're confident, if you're sure, whether yes or no, if you're confident that you want to marry this person, khalas, that's enough. If you're confident that this person is not good for you, that's enough. Why take an istikhara? You don't need to take an istikhara. Istikhara should be your last resort. When you're absolutely indecisive, you've asked, you've done your research, you've looked at that person's social networking sites, you've gotten to know the person, you've asked from his ex-wife, from her ex-husband, you've done enough research, you've done enough thinking, and still, you can't make up your mind. Then, and only then, you resort to istikhara. Then, you go to a Sayyid or a Shaykh, or if you know how to make an istikhar, and you make an istikhar. There are some people, as soon as someone comes and proposes to them for marriage, or they meet someone for marriage, immediately they go and make an istikhara. This is not right. This is not how istikhara works. Istikhara is when you've thought about it, you've asked for advice, you've done your research, you've done research from all sort of angles, and you still can't make a decision, then you resort to istikhara. Not the first day. And there are others who are the opposite extreme, that refuse to make an istikhara, and they take it lightly. Why? If you've done your work, and you still can't make a decision, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you make a decision. Don't be too extreme. There's two extremes when it comes to istikhara. Those who jump and want to make an istikhara right away, and there are those that reject. No. Remember, that there's something called tawakkul. If you've done all that you can about a person, and this person seems to have the right qualities, tawakkul ala Allah. Wa ala Allahi tawakkul al mu'minun. Don't be paranoid. Don't be paranoid. Don't go into this marriage with lots of fears and paranoia that I'm not sure is, is this person right for me. If you've done all that you can, tawakkul ala Allah. Depend on Allah and hope for the best. And also remember the power of du'a. The power of du'a. When you've done all that you can, you've done your research, you've asked for advice, and you've decided to marry this person, ask Allah for help. Say a du'a. Ask Allah to make this marriage a blessed marriage. And this person the most right, rightful person for you. The best person for you. The perfect person for you. Ask Allah. There's some people that forget this. They forget to ask Allah for help and to make this person the right person for them. Dua. Dua has immense power. Let's not forget the power of Dua. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa Muhammad.